is so wonderful to see you all here worshiping with us here at Gainesville UMC this morning. My name is Bert Miller, and I'm the youth director, if you've not met me before, and I just want to extend a welcome to everyone who is here with us today. Um, if you would all please stand for our opening hymn, Come Thou Almighty King. be seated. We all please pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, again, we thank you for this time that we have set aside this week, Lord, that we can be together in fellowship, that we can be in support of one another, and that we can be here to worship you, Lord. I pray that as we hear Pastor John's sermon in just a moment, that you give him your words, that you give him your message, and that when we hear it, we take it, we take it with us when we leave here today. And in your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Anybody notice um, the lengthening of the turn lane out there on Linton Hall that's going to turn into limestone? Did you notice that? You know why they're doing that? Because the expected crowds at Gainesville United Methodist Church are so large. <laughs> now, the reason why they're doing it is for the buses for the new high school, but Tom Schultz told me that on Friday, and I thought, hey, I like that. Because the crowds at Gainesville United Methodist Church are going to be so large, they are extending the turn lane to allow people to get in here. I really appreciated the choir's introit, choral introit. Do you know where it's from, folks? Anybody? What? It's, it's, it's thank you very much. You know what? Sometimes it's nice to have the choir back, sometimes not so much. But it's a South African tune. Do you know why I like that? Well, my wife is South African, but do you know what she's going to do, and do you know why? She'll be going back on the 4th of August because we are now grandparents. Yeah. Dalian's daughter gave birth. It was a month early, but she gave birth to a very healthy 5-pound, 4-ounce baby boy, Simeon Johannes. And so she'll be going down to spend time with her daughter, daughter Carlene, and her husband, Hunnis. And so it'll be a great time. And we're so very thankful now. You can just call me officially old because I'm a grandfather. Huh? Is that, oh, wait a minute. I'm, I'm hearing something. Grandpa. Okay, Grandpa. I'm officially old. Papa was what I call my grandfather. Papa and Mimi. Scripture this morning, Matthew 12, 24 through 32. Listen now to the word of God. But when the Pharisees heard this, they said, It is only by Beelzebub, the prince of demons, that this fellow drives out demons. Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself will be ruined, and every city or household divided against itself will not stand. 
If Satan drives out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then can his kingdom stand? And if I drive out demons by Beelzebub, by whom do your people drive them out? So then they will be your judges. But if I drive out demons by the Spirit of God, then your kingdom has then his then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Or again, how can anyone enter a strong man's house and carry off his possessions unless he first ties up the strong men? Then he, then he can rob his house. He who is not with me is against me, and he who does not gather with me scatters. And so I tell you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven men, but the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forsaken, forgiven. Anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but anyone who speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven either in this age or in the age to come. Again, like I did two weeks ago, let's not say praise and thanksgiving just yet over these because these are some of those words, some of those difficult words that Jesus spoke. I mean, think about it. Oh, wow. We got Beelzebub, we've got Satan, we've got demons, we've got the unforgivable sin. These are inconvenient words. I almost feel like I should have the Rolling Stones playing in the background. You know, remember the song? Or nobody remembers the song? Jeff, I looked at Jeff. Jeff, Jeff remembers this. Okay, Clark remembers this. Sympathy for the devil. Do you ever hear the tagline or the chorus of that? Pleased to meet you, hope you guessed my name. But what's puzzling you is the nature of my game. That's the issue here. Now, before we go any further, I have to tell you, I did not want to preach this. I really didn't. Six o'clock this morning, I thought about chucking it. I thought about just opening up the Bible and giving you a 15-minute Bible lesson and being done with it. This is an uncomfortable topic for me. I am not... A radical fundamentalist. Not. I believe in the Bible. I believe in Jesus Christ. I believe Jesus Christ died for our sins. I believe in all of those things, but I'm not one who sees demons under every rock or devils behind every door. And this one is a tough one. To talk about this, this is almost one that I'd like to throw out. In fact, that was the alternate title for this message. Let's throw these out. These words, they're inconvenient. They make me feel kind of weird. But when we start throwing things out of Scripture, where do we start? And who here among us is really qualified that knows Greek that well? None of us. So I tend to just take the Bible for what it says. But boy, I like to avoid this subject. This one, this talk of Beelzebub, of the devil and of demons, it seems so primitive and unsophisticated. We live in the 21st century. This is the golden age of science. We got two billionaires competing with each other to be the first civilians in space, powered by their own rockets. This is the time of scientific discovery and this idea of demons and Satan and devils this one makes me feel uncomfortable, even somewhat embarrassed. So I really did want to just kind of throw this one out and not do anything with it. I didn't want to preach it. Get a little embarrassed. It's unsophisticated. Maybe in Jesus' day it was good. You know, when you think about it, you have a very unsophisticated, very unscientific audience, and they needed some way to wrap their heads around all the evil that was in the world, and so Jesus gave them Beelzebub. But if Jesus came back today, he wouldn't talk about that. He wouldn't talk about devils or personification of evil. Would he? If you say no, and if you say there is no person called the devil, do you know that you would be in the majority of American Christians? There's a group called Barna, and they do studies and surveys with religious groups. And do you know that they studied almost 2,000, they did a survey of almost 2,000 professing Christians in the United States. Guess what percentage said the devil doesn't exist? 
almost 60% of American Christians say that the devil doesn't exist. Interesting, because there was a French poet in the 19th century. I would try to pronounce his name, but I botched it at the first service, didn't use it at the second service, so I'm not going to use it again. There was a 19th century French poet who really anticipated this. He said this, that is the devil's, devil's cleverest wile to convince us that he does not exist. To convince us he doesn't exist. Maybe we think, maybe we've convinced ourselves that there really is no such thing as Satan, the devil, and any of these things that Jesus is talking about here. It's just the way that a primitive society in the first century dealt with the problem of evil. They needed a person to understand it. A person to kind of hang it on their head. Someone to say, this is who caused these things to happen. So Jesus spoke to them about him, she, or it. But if Jesus were here today, he probably wouldn't use those words. He wouldn't go into devils and demons. He would, we were a scientific society. We understand the world in different ways. We don't see devils under the pew. We don't see devils in the closet. We don't see demons everywhere. We don't do exorcisms. Besides, I don't want to clean up all the pea soup. Okay, a couple of you got that one. You don't know the backstory about the movie Exorcist? That when she spewed out all that stuff, when the demon was being released from her body, it was pea soup. Uh, I shouldn't have used it. it Eight o'clock, it just felt like a lead balloon. 9.30, it worked. It didn't work here. Sorry to say, it didn't work here. No, we're not talking about that. Because that's another one of the devil's great tricks. Making us think that either you've got to be all the way on this side, seeing demons everywhere, or you've got to be on the other side, he doesn't exist. But I'm preaching this message that I didn't want to preach this morning because there's a middle ground. And I call it the middle ground of preparedness. Because he does exist. And because he's always working at cross purposes with God. Because he is always working against the church. He's always working against Christians who want to follow Jesus Christ into the world. He's got a plan. He's got a purpose. And he is about it every single day, every single hour, every single minute of every day. And so I call this that place that we can find in the middle, a time of preparedness, to prepare ourselves to fight this spiritual warfare that we are in, whether we acknowledge it or not, whether we believe it or not. Jesus in the New Testament as a whole, as I said before, the reality of the devil is he is always against the things that God is doing. He's against God's kingdom. He's against followers of Jesus Christ. He's against this. If you've been around here any length of time, do you know what this is? Say it again. One more, thank you. One more, Marv. The core mission of the church for 2,000 years has been one thing, to bring one more person into the kingdom of God. To bring one more person into a life-transforming relationship with Jesus Christ. And then one more, and then one more. And I promise you that the evil one, the enemy, Beelzebub, the devil, whatever you want to call him, Satan, he is always against that. He is always at cross-purposes with God. Now, I know this, and I hope you know this. In the end, God is victorious. The enemy is defeated, and he's victorious. But I don't know if you know this. Right now, in this world, the enemy is given a free hand. And couple that with our free will, we have a problem. You see, we were given by God at our very beginning. We were given the power of choice. You and I. Every day, in all situations, we have the power of choice. I can hear the good news of Jesus Christ, or I can turn it off. I can accept Jesus as Lord and Savior, 
or I can say no. Now, most of us in this room live our lives in the middle. We've never rejected Jesus. We've never stood up and said, I do not believe that Jesus Christ is anything more than a man who was born in a manger in, Bethlehem, in Nazareth and grew up in Bethlehem and that's it. None of us would ever say that. In fact, if we were asked to take a survey, we'd say, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. But being fully surrendered, that's another matter entirely. That's where the enemy comes in. He doesn't want to get any of us to say, I do not believe in Jesus Christ as the Son of God. This Jesus was a historical figure, and he's nothing more than that. That's not his goal. You know what his goal is? His goal is to nudge us just a little bit each day, not just a little bit further away, not just a little bit further away, Keep us from really coming to the place where we search and look for our place in the body of Christ to build the kingdom of God. He's not working to get you to reject Jesus. He's not working to get you to live a debauched life. He's working just to nudge you away. Tell you you're too busy. You've got too much on your plate. Let somebody else do it. He just wants to nudge us a little bit. He wants us to feel that we don't know the love of Christ anymore. Now, I know what you're saying. You're thinking, I read somewhere in the book of Romans, I think it was the 8th chapter, the 38th and 39th voice, verse, that nothing can take me away from the love of Christ. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. Absolutely correct. But there is one thing. Me. I can separate myself from the love of Christ. And so this one that we pretend doesn't exist, this one that really is just a symbol for evil in the world, nudges us just a little bit further away a little bit further away that's his plan that's his purpose he doesn't want the church to stand up and reject Jesus just move us away move us away so that we're no longer focused on being the hands and feet of Christ no longer focused on the mission the core mission of the church he's just saying look You've done enough. If you're older, it's someone else's turn. You're too old. If you're younger, you're not old enough. You don't have the experience. You know what I found about being a follower of Jesus Christ? You can pick up the Bible and look at the bottom, and there is no expiration date. There's no expiration date for being a follower of Jesus Christ. There's not a time in our lives when we can say, I don't know enough, I'm not old enough. Well, maybe when you're one and a half or two. And there's no age where you can say, I don't, I've done enough. I don't need to do any more. There's nothing for me to do. Folks, there is. And the one who's telling us that we don't have the time, we're too old, we're too young, that's the one that we're trying to say doesn't exist. And he does. He's at work all of the time, and we ignore him at our own peril. Like I said, he doesn't want you to reject Jesus. He just wants you to draw away from him, to be less committed, to have other things that are more important, other things that are priorities in your life. Remember two weeks ago, if you were here, Jesus said, and these are hard words, harsh words, unless... You hate in comparison to your love for me, your mother, your father, your brother, your sister, your children, your spouse. You're not worthy of me. And unless you take up your cross and follow me, you're not worthy of me. Difficult words. But I told you two weeks ago, it's for our benefit. To hear Jesus' words about a devil that's so unsophisticated, so uncultured, seems ridiculous in the 21st century 
understand that his words are true and that there is this enemy is also for our benefit. Why and how? So we can resist. So we can resist. It's always whispering in our ear. You've done enough. You've read the scriptures enough. You've prayed enough. You've volunteered enough. You've given enough. He wants us to listen to his voice, not the voice of the Spirit. In fact, he would tell us that the voice of the Spirit, of the Spirit is just our imagination. The Holy Spirit is just our imagination. It's not really God's voice speaking to us. And eventually, as it says, and this is what I think the unforgivable sin is, I didn't include this in either two, the other sermons. You guys are special. You get to hear this. Here's what I believe the unforgivable sin is, the sin against the Spirit. As you reject the Spirit, you say no to the Spirit so long and so often that you no longer hear the Holy Spirit. And then you can't ask for forgiveness because you're no longer hearing the voice of God. I think that's the unforgivable sin. We do it to ourselves. We do it to ourselves by rejecting that voice. And all the while, we don't understand that there's another voice whispering in our ear that we say doesn't exist. 59% of Americans, American Christians, not just Americans, American Christians say doesn't exist. He's just a symbol for the evil that's in the world. I think he's much more than a symbol. I think he's a whisperer. He whispers in our ear, fine, fill out that survey online. Tell the world that you believe in Jesus, but stop it there. Fine, go to church. Try not to go every Sunday. There are other things that are more important. Fine, go to church, but don't volunteer. Especially don't volunteer for Sunday school, vacation, Bible school, or youth group. Because he knows you kill off the next generation, you kill the church. Anybody here? Don't raise your hand on this. Anybody here who wasn't introduced to Jesus as a child or a youth? I doubt it. Someone along the line introduced you to Jesus, and most likely it was when you were a child or you, when you, you were a youth. So all he has to do is whisper in our ear, yeah, you don't need to really volunteer. They'll find somebody else. And there are not enough Sunday school teachers, not enough VBS people, not enough youth leaders. And another generation just kind of slides away. He's real. I don't like the idea of preaching this sermon. I really don't. It makes me extremely uncomfortable. I tend to think of myself as a fairly sophisticated, modern 21st century person, and this sounds so, so unsophisticated. But to ignore him, I would do so at my own peril, and it would be foolish. He's always at work doing the same thing, trying to separate people from the love of God that is found in Christ Jesus. No, he can't do it, but he can make us do it. Not make us do it, excuse me, that's wrong. He can tempt us into doing it. And he is so much more successful when we don't think he exists. When we think he doesn't exist, we think, fine, I'm great the way I am. I'm fine with the way I am. In fact, there's a whole branch of Christianity out there that teaches us to embrace the world's values and just get more of the world's goods. Embrace the fact that, really, that's what God wants for you, to have more this, more that, more goods, more things, more bigger houses, bigger cars. That's what God wants for you. There's no need to be transformed. because we don't realize it's him speaking in our ear. We don't hit our knees and ask for forgiveness. We don't hit our knees and repent because he whispers in our ears, you're fine just the way you are. 
You said you believed in Jesus. That's all it takes. And he's right. He's great at telling half-truths. That's all it takes is belief in Jesus. But when I say I believe in Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, that's when the journey begins. And he doesn't want you on the journey. He wants you to stop right there, leave it right there. You believe, he's right. That's enough. But read the rest of the words of Jesus. Take up your cross and follow me. Go into all the world and make disciples. This is what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. The devil loves believers. Let it stop right there. Let it stop and do nothing with it. When we think that we can be just like the world, and that's all God wants, wants us to have more of the things of this world, We've forgotten something that I mentioned two weeks ago that Benson mentioned last week. The scripture from John 17. Father, I pray that they be in the world, but not of the world. In the world, but not of the world. In the world, but not having the world's values. Not having the world's priorities. Not having the world's value systems. In the world, but not of the world. The enemy nudges us and said, he doesn't really mean that. It's great to have all of these things. And so slowly, we start to make those things our priorities. We start to give our time and our energy and our money to accumulating more of those things. And the devil's saying, good job. You still believe, don't you, right? Oh yeah, still believe. Good job. He doesn't care that you believe. He wants to make you ineffective for the core mission of the church of Jesus Christ. One more into the kingdom of God. One more who has a transforming relationship with Jesus Christ. One more who now knows how loved they are by God. Remember when you first experienced the love of God? Do you remember it? Do you remember the joy that you had? If you haven't experienced it, I would love to talk with you about it in person or on the phone. Because when you first experience what it is to know that God loves me unconditionally, it's a joy that's inexpressible. We try hymns and contemporary worship songs try all the time. I don't think we ever get totally there, do we, Janet? The joy of knowing that we are loved unconditionally. God calls us to introduce that to someone who doesn't know it. The enemy will do everything he can to keep us from doing that. I don't know enough of the Bible. I just don't feel comfortable doing that. I wouldn't know what to say. Jesus said that when that time comes, he said to his disciples, when you're there, when you're called before the courts, when you're called into trial, the Holy Spirit will give you the words to say. I believe that the Holy Spirit will always give us the words to say when we are open being the hands and feet of Christ out there in the world. Open to fulfilling that great commission. Open to being a part of the core mission of the church. But the enemy, he's working constantly to keep as many Christians on the sideline as possible. He doesn't care if we fill the pews as long as we don't get off the sidelines. He doesn't care if we have standing room only, as long as we say, great, been to church, that's enough, good job. But when Christians say, I'm going to take up my cross and follow him, that's when he gets nervous. 
and he wants to nudge us just a little further away, a little further away, to ignore that he exists. Maybe this is not a great analogy. Let me see if I can explain it better. Can you imagine? When, do the, when does the Washington football team play its first game? September? We'll say September 3rd. I don't know. Can you imagine the offensive line, quarterback, wide receiver, slot receiver, tailback, line up at the 25-yard line, and they see no opposition, no defense, no linemen, no linebackers, no safeties, no corners, nobody. They think that all they have to do is go, hike, hand the ball off, and they can all just walk from the 25-yard line all the way to the goal line. What would happen to a team that imagined in their minds that there was no opposition? Come on, work with me on this. What would happen to a team that is supposed there was no opposition? Well, it crushed. I like that better than lose. They would lose and they would get crushed. If we as the church assume that there is no opposition, that's what will happen to the church. That's what will happen to followers of Jesus Christ. There is an opposition. We are in a battle. It's a spiritual battle, but it's a battle, and we need to be prepared. Next week, we're going to talk about being prepared, about putting on the full armor of God and what that means for us. This is not a battle where we fight with the anger and the hatred that so many people fight with. Our weapons are different. Our weapons are love and mercy and forgiveness and joy. What we have to offer folks is the greatest gift that has ever been given to humankind. And it was bought at a great price. The enemy wants us to think that, well, we don't need to really offer it. We don't need to talk about it. We don't need to share it. But when you think about a person who doesn't know that unconditional, never-ending love of God in their life, how empty their lives must be. And if you're called, and you are, to be the conduit by which that love is shared, all he has to do, the enemy, is to keep you on the sidelines. He wins. The kingdom of God loses. Amen.
couple of observations. If you noticed, I got up and I walked over there to listen to the choir. That's the best spot. If you are in one, two, three, four, five rows of the front, it's a very awkward angle to turn and look at the choir. I made a mistake back in 2002 when we were designing this building. These pews should have been facing directly forward, not at an angle. You all over here, it's not as bad, but over here, it is bad. I mean, I would have to turn almost 90 degrees to look back at the choir. So if you want a good view of the choir, you can go over there next week. It's a lot easier. Second thing, something I failed to say during the message that is important. One of the things that the enemy does, this was not many of my notes, I just came up with it in the middle of the sermon last, uh, last hour, loves to divide Christians. Have us bickering with each other. One of the biggest things that we bicker about, at least I found in my experience in church, church music. Don't like the hymn, don't like the anthem, don't like the style of music. You can have multiple styles of music in a church. You really can. But if he can get us bickering amongst ourselves, think about it. I'm not a Christian. I think I might want to go to church. And I witness all these people just kind of ripping into each other. Boy, I would love to come back to a place like that where people are mean and nasty to each other and yell at each other over trivial things. Think about that the next time you feel led to be fussy or complaining or angry over something in the church. Think about what voice it might be that's speaking to you. Who's nudging you? As we go to prayer, I'm going to ask you to do something that Got to ask the 9.30 service to do it, but I did the 8 o'clock, so maybe we have enough prayer warriors on this. But this week is Vacation Bible School. As I said in the message, most everyone in this room had their introduction to Jesus Christ either in Vacation Bible School, Sunday School, or youth group. I'm challenging you to pray, not just today, but on Monday, on Tuesday, on Wednesday, and Thursday, and Friday, every single day, to pray for those kids and those teachers and those youth at Vacation Bible School. We have a lot of things to pray about. As usual, it will be the hottest week of the summer, and the humidity will be up, and it will be miserable for those who are outside. Pray that we're safe, that we stay hydrated, that we don't have anybody rush to the hospital, but also pray that, and this is the more important thing, that message, I mean, it's 20,000 leagues under the sea. We got a yellow submarine out there on purpose. It really is the yellow submarine. We are doing something that's going to be fun, but the message doesn't get lost in the fun. I pray that every child that ever comes through this church walks out of it knowing that they are loved with an unconditional love a never-ending love. That's what the message of Jesus Christ is about. Pray this week that those 75 kids, we've had to limit it this year, those 75 kids hear that message loud and clear. Because remember, they haven't hit their teenage years yet. For those of you who are younger, you might remember those years. They can be difficult, they can be challenging. They can be full of doubt. You can feel like you don't belong. Can you imagine, though, a child steeped in knowing, not thinking, not hearing, but knowing that they are loved by God with an unconditional love? How much better equipped they are for those years? So pray. Pray this week for that. Then I also ask you to pray for our church as we continue to reopen and we are still continuing to reopen that we would be what the church is supposed to be there's a lot that the church is supposed to be there's a lot that we're not supposed to be 
that we find those things. We find those things that we're supposed to be. Let's bow our heads. Lord God, I thank you. I do. I thank you. But even in the midst of our stumbles, and I've had quite a few, you pick us up and you put us back to work. You don't just pick us up. You pick us up and you want to put us back to work. To be the hands and feet of Christ. Your desire for us never changes. To be agents of your love and your mercy. To be agents of good news for a world that is hurting and broken. Lord, renew our passion. Renew our joy. Renew our energy to be those hands and those feet. In Jesus' name. Well, we've got uh, a couple announcements we'd like to bring to your attention on ways that you can get involved or, or stay connected with the rest of the congregation. Uh, the first is actually, it's a thank you for everybody that came out to our trivia night this past Friday evening. Uh, we're doing trivia every other, every other week here at the church uh, at 7 o'clock on Fridays. It's the second and fourth Fridays of the month. And we had a pretty good turnout uh, this past Friday. We would love to have more people there. Um, so make sure to bring your thinking caps on uh, Friday, July 23rd. Bring a team. It's all team trivia. It's not like quick buzz-in stuff. It's all written down. Uh, but we have a great time. We provide snacks and everything. And it's just a good way for people to stay connected and, and meet other families here at the church. We also want to mention our local mission week that's coming up the week of August 2nd through the 6th. Uh, normally for our youth group, we typically do uh, out-of-state mission trips, things like that, but we were not obviously able to do that this year. So instead, we are doing a local mission week here in Prince William County. Uh, and it is primarily for the youth group, the middle and high school students, but we are opening it up as well to any adults who might be available that week. It's uh, that Monday through Friday, we're going to be working at, uh, or with other organizations here in the area. The, the food bank, uh, Serve Our Willing Warriors Retreat Center, uh, we're going to be helping out at the, the park down the road, doing some cleanup, things like that. Um, we would love to have you come and help out. We'd really appreciate it. It's, it's you show up at 9 a.m. and then you're done by 5. You can go home and have dinner with your family. Uh, if you'd like to hear about any more info about that, you can come ask me. Uh, we also have a page on it for our website where you can sign up for that. But we would love to have uh, a lot of people help out if you're available. Finally, we want to mention, uh, starting on August 18th, uh, that is a Wednesday in August, we're launching our new Wednesday evening service experience. It's going to include small group fellowship time, food, as well as a contemporary worship service here at the church. Uh, it's going to be something very different from the sorts of things that we've done in the past, but that's going to be starting on Wednesday, August 18th, and we would love to see you there. Uh, it's just kind of a, one of the things that we are using to kick off uh, all of the big reopening of the church come the new school year. Uh, finally, will you all please stand for our closing hymn this morning, Great is Thy Faithfulness.
I went over to say something to the choir, and thankfully they didn't hear a word I used because I meant orneriness, that it's so great to have the choir back. I know that I can't slide anything by, that they'll keep me honest, that if I say something, they'll give me a hard time, and it's great to have you back. It really is. By the way, I don't know who said it, but somebody said it to Janet, and I don't want to know who it was, that they were afraid that they had lost their ability to sing because they tried to sing in the shower and it didn't work. I want to tell you that maybe all of us have lost some of that. And if you've ever thought about joining the choir, there are still empty seats up there, and Janet will help you find that shower singing voice and even more. Okay, not just to sing in the shower, but more than that. Amen. Oh my goodness, thank you. Thank you, choir. But we do have empty seats up there. Folks, you will never be given a bigger trust, even if you're elected president of the United States, than the one that God gives you. He entrusts the gospel to you. He entrusts it to you so that others will come to know Jesus as Lord and Savior. It's a great trust. The enemy would tell you, oh, that's not really your job. That's the preacher's job. Or that's a church leader's job. No, it's all of our jobs. Oh, I don't know what to say. What did Jesus say to the disciples when you're hauled before the courts? Don't worry about what you're going to say. The Holy Spirit will give you the words that you need. I promise you that that same Holy Spirit will give you the words that you need to share the good news with someone else. Go in God's peace. Go in his love. And know that you are loved with an unconditional, never-ending love.